Are we good? We are indeed. Hello there. This is James Swanick. Great to have you here. Courage. How do we learn courage? How do we get motivated? How do we step up in the face of fear and make things happen? We're about to talk to a woman who has crossed the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian Oceans in a rowboat, solo. She has literally rowed across three oceans. The only, in, the only woman in the world to have done so. Her name is Roz Savage, and she joins us from just north of London right now. Roz, great to have you here. It's fantastic to be here, James. Thank you so much for having me on your show. What the hell were you thinking? <laughs> it's a very valid question. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to ask that question. I remember Jay Leno asked Hugh Grant that question when he got busted um, uh, with the hooker on, off Sunset Boulevard, the prostitute back in the day, and he walked out on the Jay Leno show and Jay Leno said, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> I remember that well. And it's funny because I watched that video again just a couple of weeks ago when I'd done something particularly embarrassing. And I was just explaining that we Brits are really good at embarrassment. And I don't think I've ever seen anyone quite so close to dying of embarrassment <laughs> on that particular Jay Leno show. It was classic. And what, but what were you doing? Why did you want to row across an ocean? <laughs> Can I also say that I have never before heard rowing cross oceans compared with being caught with your pants down. It's <laughs> 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 the first time for everything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We're off to a good start here. <laughs> <laughs> so what was I thinking? Um, <laughs> well, at least I would like to think that I was thinking with the, the head brain, unlike Hugh Grant. Um, it was kind of an extreme reaction against having spent 11 years of my life working in an office as a management consultant. Right trying to figure out what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I reached the point where I still didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up, but I knew it wasn't management consultancy. So I quit my job, quit a few other things as well, including marriage, and um, tried to figure out what I really wanted to do with my life. So you were a management consultant in oh. London, is that right? What does a management consultant mean exactly? What we do? Was it a nine to five desk job? Was it long hours? Was it what it was, was it? More like a sort of eight till six or seven. It was kind of project management. It was a uh, to, to be really brief. It was just kind of one of those grey jobs, you know, that involves lots of PowerPoint presentations and pieces of paper and. Um, I'm sorry, I'm probably alienating an awful lot of management consultants in your audience. Yeah. But in terms of a job, it was, it was a career that just didn't light you up. It was a career that didn't, uh, that didn't give you any passion. It was a nine to five kind of job, which is fine for many, many people in the world, which is absolutely fine. But for you, it was dying a slow death, I get the impression. Dying a slow death or having my soul eroded was the rather more dramatic way that I described it in my, to myself. Um, I'm not actually sure that these kinds of jobs are fine for most people. There are yeah. these surveys that year on year show that around 85% of people are either not engaged or are actively disengaged from their job. And so... I was definitely in that 85%. Yeah. And, and how old were you when, when you were doing this? Were you in your, in your 20s? Were you in your... Like, what stage of life yeah, were you in well, at this point? I'd got a law degree. Um, growing up, I was really good at passing exams. And the trouble is, when you're good at passing exams, you end up going down a very sort of predictable path. Yes. And so, Julie, when I graduated, I did what everybody else was doing. And back then, this is 1989, she said, giving away her age. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone wanted to be investment bankers or management consultants. And so I just kind of followed the crowd and thought I ought to be happy. You know, it's, um, I know it's definitely a first world problem. I should have counted myself being really lucky. I had a, a decent salary, reasonable job security, as secure as anybody ever is. Mm. And life should have been perfect. But the trouble is on the inside, it just felt like I was being crushed by the machine. Yeah. Yeah. I felt that way at, at times over my, um, you know, my, in my adult life. Uh, it's, it is a first, there are first world problems, but they, those first world problems can be very stressful. I mean, if we're not growing, um, in our lives, like if we're not moving forward spiritually, right? If we if we know there's something that we're capable of doing, but we, we're not doing it and we're not moving forward in that aspect, then we are dying inside. We are dying spiritually. 
I mean, it's not like we're, we're not going to have food and shelter and, and, and water and things like that. We'll always be okay. But spiritually, we're, we're just dying inside. It sounds like that's where you were at. Now, let me ask you this, Ros. Were you a rower? Were you like in, did you row in school? Were you naturally good at this? Or is this something that you just picked up before you decided to go and cross three oceans? <laughs> You'll laugh at this. I mean, I'm actually hideously unsporty. <laughs> And I'm only five foot four, so if anybody listening to this thinks I'm some sort of Amazonian type woman, I'm just absolutely not. Um, I was um, useless at physical education when I was at school. Couldn't catch, couldn't throw, was kind of small and uncoordinated and nobody wanted me on their team. But then when I got to university, I thought, well, I really ought to do some exercise. I was mostly motivated by wanting to be able to eat more without getting fat. And um, so I took up rowing and found to my great surprise that I actually really liked it. So I rowed pretty seriously at university, um, but then pressures of work ended up giving up rowing and didn't row for about 11 years until a a sort of weird um, coincidence of sort of decision points and awakenings came together and um, led to the ocean rowing. Wow. Okay. We're talking to Roz Savage here. Uh, If you're watching on Facebook Live, as uh, we have some people here, hello, Facebook Live. If you have a question for Roz, please do type it in here and we'll make sure that we ask her um, uh, the question and she will answer it for you. So if you've got a question here, I know we've got a few viewers here. Uh, Let's have a look here. Uh, Jaycar says, I'm just getting out of college. I don't want to do a job. I want to be an entrepreneur. What do you recommend, Roz? Go for it. (laughs) Yeah, if your heart's calling you to do something, um, it takes courage, as we're talking about today, to go out on your own. But um, going back to that survey about job satisfaction and engagement, uh, people who've got their own businesses or work in small companies where they really have a voice that's going to be heard. They are so much happier than people who are the small cogs in the very big machines. Yeah. So, yeah. If you've got a passion, then I would absolutely, if you know what you want to do, just go for it. Don't even think twice. But how did you get to the point where you knew you wanted to set forth on a, on a rowing expedition? And just, I know we're, we're sort of fast forwarding saying that you crossed three oceans, but th- let's do the first one. I don't know if that was the hardest one. Um, yes, it absolutely was. Yeah. yeah. So um, what's the context and the, you know, the build up to that and, and, and how that came about then? Sure. Um, when I was trying to figure out what was wrong with this picture during my dying days, as it were, in management consultancy, it was almost like my soul had been worn away until there was just like this little, it was almost like the dying sputter of what remains of, of my soul that just somehow refused to give up and die. And I was trying to find an answer to this question. Like, if I'm not happy with this superficially perfect life, then what will make me happy? And I did this exercise, which I highly recommend, although with the government health warning that it really can seriously change your life. Um, I imagine that I was writing my own obituary mm. or um, what they were, the eulogy that they were going to read out at my funeral. And I wrote two versions of it, the one that I wanted and the one that I was actually heading for if I carried on living my life mm. as I was then. And the fantasy obituary wasn't really about what I would do. It certainly didn't mention ocean rowing, but it was about the kind of person that I would be. And I thought about the obituaries I really enjoyed reading. And they were these, these colourful characters who would just get out there and try stuff. And it didn't even really seem to matter all that much whether they succeeded or failed. But they just really seemed to live without fear, without mm. limits. Mm. And um, as I was writing it, it was almost like I'd opened a portal into a parallel universe when I was where I was living the life that, I was supposed to be living it felt incredibly real to me even though it was worlds away from how I was actually living at that point Mm. so I think the writing was on the wall from then on and then I had an environmental awakening um became very concerned about what's I won't say what we're doing to the planet but actually what we're doing to ourselves um and it's really not going to go all that well for the humans if we don't get our act together seriously and I was so fired up about this. I just really felt I had to do something and I didn't know what I was going to do. I was just a recovering management consultant, but I just knew I had to do something. 
and then I had a, a chance meeting with a with a guy who'd rode across the Atlantic and, and just somehow all of these ideas collided mm. and a light bulb went on and I just went brilliant that's what I'm going to do I'm going to row across oceans and use my blogs and my podcasts and my my books and my talks to raise awareness of our environmental challenges and so <laughs> it, it was pretty out there. I mean, it was so unlike anything I'd ever done before. And I'm sure my friends thought I'd lost the plot. But to me, it made perfect sense. So but did it make perfect sense in the moment where it was like, oh, I know, I'm just going to row across the Atlantic. I mean, did you have any idea about how hard it would be to row across the Atlantic? Or were you oh, kind gosh, of just like... no. <laughs> If I'd have had any idea how hard it was going to be, I, I would have talked myself out of it. Um, I think I knew immediately... Like I knew in my heart that it was the perfect project for me, but then my head or my self-protecting ego kicked in and was saying, don't be stupid. Like you, you haven't even been to sea before other than, you know, on a cross channel ferry. And um, so I kept trying to think of convincing reasons why I shouldn't do it, but it only made me more determined that I was going to do it. And so after having this sort of inner dialogue backwards and forwards for about a week, I just knew I absolutely had to do it. And in fact, right from the start, the ambition was to, well, originally it was to row around the whole world. And then I found out you can't actually do that in a rowboat because they're okay. not that maneuverable and you can't really go upwind. So I, I decided I would only row across the, uh, the three big oceans. So just, uh, just describe what, a, what the particular rowboat that you rode in looks like. How big is it? Because I know, I'm sure the, the listener or viewer might be imagining a rowboat and it's kind of like, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. And they're imagining just a little two-person uh, thing here. So can you just describe what it looks like and what provisions you can keep and how it's, you know, whether it's set up with satellite navigation and all that kind of stuff? It is a lot more seaworthy than the little ones on the lake in Central Park. <laughs> um, it's um, it is specially designed for crossing oceans. It's about 23 feet long, seven meters, um, or six feet wide, um, two meters. And it's got a cabin at each end. The one in the bow is for storage. The one in the stern is for sleeping. Those are relatively watertight. And then in the middle, you've got this open deck, which is where the rowing seat is. And that's where I would spend 12 hours a day um, rowing. And so there's plenty of storage space. I could easily, the, the longest voyage I've ever done, jumping forward a bit here, was five months alone at sea. And I had plenty enough food with me to last that long. So I'm on my own out there. There's no supply boat, no chase boat. It's just, just me and my little rowboat. So... Uh, I've done a 10 day silent meditation called Vipassana, but I haven't done a five month silent meditation stuck at sea. So <laughs> I used to think that I was pretty cool and I had some pretty cool bragging rights. Like I could say, yeah, went 10 days without talking once. Yeah. I'm pretty cool. Silent meditation. People go, wow, that's amazing. You just blew that out of the water, Oz. <laughs> well, actually, um, let's even things up a bit. Friends keep telling me how amazing Vipassana is. And I keep looking at it. And then I think it was that you're not allowed to take in a journal. That, for me, I'm afraid, was the deal breaker. So I have not yet done Vipassana. Yeah. You can sneak a piece of paper and a pen in. I may or may not have done that. I'm not saying I'm not going to reveal in case anyone from Vipassana is listening. Um, okay. So you set out on this, this, this journey. You're in this rowboat. How long was it supposed to take? Where did you leave from and where were you, where were you to end, end up on the first trip? Yep, so this is the Atlantic, yes. uh, which is 10 years ago now. I was heading out from the Canary Islands, just off the coast of Africa, okay. 3,000 miles to Antigua in the Caribbean. And one of my sponsors had offered me double the money if I managed to break the women's record, which was 56 days at that mm. point. Unfortunately, I picked the worst possible year. Um, 2005, year of Hurricane Katrina, and yeah. more named storms in the Atlantic than right. any year since records began. So my timing could have been better. Um, it ended up taking me 103 days. And for most of that, I did have the use of my satellite phone, which was how I could check in with my mum each day, let her know that I was still alive and still okay. Um, but in fact, that broke 24 days before the end. So that was definitely the more Vipassana-like yeah. past voyage. Did people As still know that you were okay when your phone broke for 24 hours, that people could still track you okay? 
Yeah, I had a transponder on my boat that was sending back my position via satellite. But I'm sure my poor, long-suffering mum in the, the wee hours of the night was probably wondering if the tracker was still on the boat and if I was still on the boat. And um, we'd lost my dad just the year before. And um, she later told me that when my phone broke, it was like being bereaved all over again. Yeah, so I can I'm imagine. I'm mum. <laughs> she did have a few more grey hairs the next time I saw her. <laughs> I know we're bouncing around between a few of the different trips that you're having. We're talking about the first one and then we're kind of talking about the other ones. Um, and I know we're talking here about courage and how to overcome fear. Let me ask you this question. Um, what was the lowest point that you had on any of your three journeys? And just to go over it, you, you crossed the Atlantic from the Canary Islands to, to, Antigua. to Antigua. And then you crossed the Pacific from where to where? Um, San Francisco to Papua New Guinea okay. and I started off in Hawaii and bonus points for anybody who's heard of the Republic of Kiribati, um, I stopped off there as well on the way across the Pacific. Um, Kiribati got the distinction of being the only country in the world that's in the northern and southern and eastern and western hemispheres. Okay and then the Indian Ocean you, cr you yeah. left from where and you ended up where? Yep from your home country isn't it Australia? Yes yes ma'am. I left from Perth uh -huh. and went to, um, to Mauritius, which is just off the coast of Africa. So oh. that was about 4,000 miles. And on that last but, trip there, you would have sailed across where they suspect the m missing Malaysian MH330 flight is. Uh, is it 310, MH310? They're, they're still searching for that Malaysian uh, yeah. airlines plane that went down. And I think that it's gone down over the Indian Ocean there between Perth and, and, uh, and East Africa. I think it really goes to show just how huge the ocean is. Um, I think I've, I've worked, because you know, they've been trying to find it and they, they just yeah. can't find it with all of their yeah. sophisticated um, equipment. Yeah. Um, I worked out when I was doing the Pacific, which was 8,000 miles altogether, that um, like if my boat was the size of a pinhead, like, you know, one millimeter across, yeah. then, um, the Pacific would be three miles. So imagine on a three mile walk, Wow. Trying to find a pin, a pin that's been stuck into the ground. Wow. Like, Great analogy. Yeah. Pin, just a dressmaking pin. We're talking to Roz Savage, who is the only woman in the world to have crossed three oceans solo. Um, Roz, the lowest point on any of those three trips where, you know, you're in the, in the famous, you know, analogy of the hero's journey, you have someone who's in the pit of despair and they don't think they're going to get out and then they find a way to dig deep and get out. We see it in many movies and themes. Um, uh, everyone has their own hero's journey where at one stage they were struggling and seemingly out, but they find, found a way to triumph. Um, tell us about your lowest of low points. <laughs> oh, so many to choose from. <laughs> um, the first one was about six hours into the first voyage when I'm hanging over the side of the boat being just horrendously seasick uh, and it's getting dark and I'm feeling really alone and actually really quite stupid just thinking, <laughs> as you asked at the start, what the hell was I thinking when this right. seemed like a good idea? Um, the first two weeks that first crossing were just incredibly hard um i was in quite a lot of pain and oh but um i think there's a lot to be said for having enough naive optimism to get yourself into something mm -hmm. uh, this may go to your entrepreneur listener enough naive optimism to get yourself into something and then too much stubborn pride to get yourself out of it <laughs> just have to find a way to hang on in there and keep on going yeah um there was a really low point my first attempts on the pacific when i left from north of San Francisco and about 10 days out ran into a really big storm and my boat was just capsizing and capsizing and somebody um, reading my blog became rather concerned about me and without asking me first sent out the US Coast Guard to come and pick me up um, which didn't go down very well with me at all <laughs> but um, yeah that one ended up in the back of a, a Coast Guard helicopter and I'm very grateful to, you know that I'm not dissing the Coast Guard. They do a fantastic job. I just didn't really want to meet them in those circumstances. So did you, um, think you, you would think you, you, could, you were confident you were going to get out of that situation and you didn't need the Coast Guard to come and help you? Is that what it was? Yeah, this is the stubborn pride bit <laughs> that um, I, I really wanted to keep on going. But we, 
argued it backwards and forwards for about, well, we discussed it backwards and forwards for about six hours. And I'd lost some of my equipment in one of the capsizers. And ultimately, I just thought, well, it's better to be a live donkey than a dead lion. So I accepted the rescue. But it was a horrible, horrible feeling um, after I'd spoke to them on the radio saying, you know, okay, send, cause I was talking to the people in the fixed wing plane. Uh, mm. And when they, when I said, okay, send out the helicopter, I just hung up the radio and burst into tears. And it didn't help that then all the internet trolls came out and just had a field's day. And there was all this, you know, people who didn't know the facts of the story, didn't know I was already very experienced and really knew what I was doing and had private rescue insurance. So if I had wanted a rescue, it would have been from the insurance company, not, from the US Coast Guard, et cetera, et cetera. But it's helped me to develop a thicker skin anyway, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So that was- Was that, uh, um, was that uh, when you got back to safety, were you, like how long before you went again? How long before you got up and went again? Um, well, when I got back to safety, I still had to salvage my boat because when they airlift yeah. you, they don't airlift your boat. So we managed to do that. And I really wanted to get going again that year. I was just mortified by the whole experience and just wanted to sort of <laughs> erase and rewind and um, get back out there. But it was too late in the season by then. So I had to wait another nine months before. Wow. My next okay. So that was, a, that was a, what you would call, I guess, a failed attempt to cross on the second time and uh what did that teach you what did that experience there teach you mm, <laughs> not to put so much heavy data gathering equipment on the top of my boat <laughs> but more deeply it taught me that there are more important things in life than other people's opinions and in fact all that vitriol that came out said much more about those people sitting on their backsides in their nice, warm, comfortable homes, just, you know, tapping on a keyboard, criticise. You know, I love that Theodore Roosevelt quote about it's not the critic that counts. You know, yeah. it's, it's the poor dude who's in the arena covered in sweat and blood and mud and, you know, just yeah. getting lucky. And um, so I, um, I think... I'd already come a long way in not caring too much about what other people think of me before I started the rowing, but that definitely helped me to, to get a thicker skin about uh, <laughs> public humiliation. Yeah. I remember I, I experienced some, something very minor compared to what you just explained, Ros, but I, I, I interviewed the, the rock star John Bon Jovi when I was th 35 wow. in, in 2010. And at the end of the interview, I asked him a couple of questions about my favorite English uh, Premier League soccer team, um, Tottenham Hotspur, just as a joke. I said, let me ask you some questions about Tottenham, which you'll have absolutely no clue what the answer is. And um, that, will be, that will be funny. And I'll just put it on my Tottenham blog because I had a Tottenham blog and there were some other Tottenham blogs out there. And so I recorded this thing, the John Bon Jovi, and it was hilarious. It was really, really funny. And then I posted the YouTube link, which you can still see to this day if you type in my name, James Swanick, John Bon Jovi, Tottenham. And I posted it in a few Tottenham fan forums. And um, I wouldn't say it was most people, but I'd say like maybe 30 or 40% just smashed me and said, this is stupid. You're not a real fan. Well, get this crap off here. What the hell has this guy got to do? I hate that guy's music. Stop wasting our time and only talk about, only talk about Tottenham here. And I was like depressed for three days. Now, this is nothing compared to you being rescued by a US, the US Coast Guard, you know, when your life is in danger. But I, rem I remember feeling like really hurt for like three days afterwards. And I was walking the streets of New York with my head down going, wow, this is the first time I've actually been really publicly criticized. It wasn't even public. It was just amongst, you know, thousands of Tottenham fans, but being smashed for doing something that I thought was actually really cool and, and really funny. And then finally, my friend said to me, he said, James, don't worry about it. There's always going to be haters in the world. Just do what you want to do and do it the way you want to do it. And there'll always be people out there who are going to love you and support you. And there are always going to be people out there who are going to smash you, but just forget about this, the people who smash you and just carry on. So uh, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to take away from your story, Ros, but that was, that was, you know, just my own little first experience of, of that. And I'm assuming maybe you felt something on a much grander level when that happened, when you were rescued. Well, I'm sure a lot of people have been through something parallel to this because whatever it is that you're creating, whatever 
you're trying to do in the world, you know, when, whether you're wanting to entertain people or to inspire people, there's a certain vulnerability in putting yourself out there. And people aren't always going to respect that. And I guess we do open the door to occasionally get a complete smashing. Yeah. And um, actually, one of uh, my sort of long time supporters in California sent me a little rhyme from Dr. Seuss, which is, those that minds don't matter and those that matter don't mind. Oh, that's and, nice. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just remind myself of that. And in fact, something that really helped pick me up, I was staying in a tiny little surf town in, in just north of, of uh, San Francisco at a friend's house, kind of licking my wounds and <laughs> trying to pluck up the courage to get back out there into the world. And I watched a film about the Dixie Chicks and the time when the lead singer said that she was ashamed to come from the same state as George W. Bush. I remember that, yeah. And people were like burning their CDs in the streets and sending death threats and, you know, just really overreacting to this. And it caused, you know, obviously quite uh, some consternation and soul searching within the band. But um, the two other girls really stood by the lead singer. And in fact, she just came out fighting. She even said it again. She really just said a big sort of F you to, to all the people. And you know what? It actually did wonders for their, yeah. their, for their profile ultimately. And they found a whole new audience. So after you've licked your, licked your wounds and, you know, you had nine months and then you went back out and again, what, what happened then? Let's, let's talk about the second attempt crossing the Pacific and then the Indian Ocean. And then we'll wrap this up with, with lessons learned, you know, how to be courageous and how to overcome obstacles, which we'll get to just in a couple of minutes. But can you just finish this, the story as to what happened from there? Yeah, yeah, to get some completion on that. Um, and by the way, just before you do that, I've got a comment here uh, from one of our Facebook followers. Uh, Melanie, who says, uh, I love this woman. Her lowest point is when she got rescued. And then um, Melanie says, it's not the critic that counts. Brilliant. She's just emphasizing what, what, uh, what it is that you said. Uh, Jake asks, can we have your website, Roz? Can we have your website now? Absolutely. It's um, all the W's. And then uh, Roz Savage Coaching. That's Roz with a, a Z or a Z, depending on your nationality uh, Roz Savage Coaching and I blog there about once a week and there's links to my other social media stuff as well um, um, we for the to... real stuff um, there's also rozsavage.com is okay I don't post there anymore but that's got all the rowing archive on it we also have another uh, question here how did you feel after you accomplished your goal of rowing solo Let, let's get to that let's let's have you finish the the Pacific leg and then move on to yeah. the leg and then I'll ask you how you felt can I just pick up on something? Um, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name of your listener, but um, she made the comment about um, the lowest point being when I was yeah, rescued. Melanie. The, the, the listener was yeah, Melanie. Yeah. It just occurred to me that's quite a nice twist on the traditional fairy tale, isn't it? I'm, I'm starting to get, it's one of my pet peeves these days, is these um, fairy tales that we're told when we're young, and they're incredibly disempowering for women or for girls. You know, the, the, the princesses tend to be terribly passive and they're waiting there to be rescued by their Prince Charming or whoever. And it's, I was speaking at Disney the other day and I was just going, we, we definitely need more inspiring fairy tale heroines here. And, you know, luckily they've now created Merida in the movie Brave, who's just, you know, such a badass heroine, lover. Um, but it is an interesting twist that in the fairy tales, the best moment for the princess is when she gets rescued. Right. For me, it was my worst moment. Yeah. So thanks, Melanie, for that little... Thank you, Melanie. ...little gem. <laughs> um, so to, yeah, finish off the oceans. Um, so failed attempts on the Pacific was 2007. Um, set out again from under the Golden Gate Bridge in 2008. Took me 99 days to row to Hawaii. And I was... That was one of my best voyages ever. And what pleased me so much about that one was I'd struggled massively on the Atlantic. I know we're going to come back to the lessons learned. Um, on the Atlantic, not only did everything break and I got injured, but psychologically, I made life so unbelievably hard for myself. I just made every mistake in the book. And we'll come back to that later on. And then I spent really the year or so after the Atlantic really working hard, doing the work on taking those lessons I'd learned and weaving them into the fabric of who I am because I didn't want to leave that 
smarter, wiser woman I'd become by the end of the Atlantic. I didn't want to leave her out there on the ocean. I needed to make sure that when I was back on dry land with all of the, the old triggers from my old life around me, um, that I would respond in the new way rather than my old way. So I was then able to put that to the test on that road to Hawaii and it really works. And I just coped with it so much better in my head, which is really the only place that matters. Um, so that was a great voyage. And then the following year, 2009, rode from Hawaii to Kiribati across the equator, had my little party at the equator. And then 2010, rode from Kiribati to uh, Papua New Guinea, where I was greeted on the dock by about 5,000 complete strangers. It was just brilliant. <laughs> Such a blast. Wow. Yeah, that was a cool moment. Um, I mean, it's, I've been so touched over the years. Just the kindness of strangers. People just show up to see some mad English woman in a rowboat. <laughs> why? <laughs> I, mean, I don't know why, but there's, it's, it's very humbling. And well, I think they show up because they understand how, how monumental and Herculean that the, 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 your feat is or, or, or that it was, you know, and so people respect and admire that and want to celebrate that. Maybe it, 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 it lightens up a part of their soul or their, or their, the spirit, if you like, to see what is possible. So maybe, you know, them coming to celebrate and, and, you know, and congratulate you is them actually celebrating their own lives, you know, of warming their own spirit to be able to understand what is possible. That's lovely. Thank you, James. And I'll, I'll take that. I sometimes have difficulty really owning what I've done because I see so many people out there who tackle unbelievable challenges that they didn't get to choose. You know, they, they lose a limb in a bombing or they um, give birth to a disabled child or they have to look after aging parents and they don't get to choose that and they don't get to be interviewed on a podcast about it. And so I sometimes struggle a bit to really own what I've done. But I think we do need the people who are willing to go out there and do something out of the ordinary because it does lift us all up. Yes, it certainly does. You, you have lifted us up, Roz. And so I, I would love to ask you, just to summarize, if you, if you would, um, we've got a listener or a viewer who's, who's heard your, your story and followed you and I'm sure is feeling very inspired by it. Maybe some people are thinking that you're crazy, but at the same time, they can't help. More points of view. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, thinking that you're crazy is, is kind of exciting as well. And just, you know, again, like it makes people think what is possible. But we started off talking about courage. Okay. We started talking about courage, um, getting motivated. I know you talked about having a vision and, you know, how to release inner strengths. What, what are the lessons that you've learned that, that you could really, you know, pass on to the viewer and the listener right now and how they can live their life? So I'm bursting to say so many things, but, uh, if I had to prioritize, um, so when I decided that I was going to cross these three oceans, I didn't even know how much I didn't know. But I came up with enough of a plan to give myself the delusion that I knew what I was doing. Um, had this huge to-do list. And I really just started putting one foot in front of another. And what I found was that because I had this real burning passion about the environment and probably equally matched by a burning desire to find out who I was, or in fact, who I could be, really wanted to explore that and that massive motivation gave me the courage to do all of these extraordinary things that I would never have done before like getting out there and seeking sponsorship and um, doing just ridiculous amounts of training and um, just it was so massively energizing I really felt like it's almost like in the in the Wizard of Oz you know when she's in Kansas and everything's black and white and then when she goes to Oz and everything's amazing Technicolor I really felt like that commitment to make this project you know to row around the world or bust uh, it just unleashed all of these resources inside me that the courage the resourcefulness the creativity the determination and I would just be one, <laughs> during that chapter of my life, I'd be one of those really annoying people that bounces out of bed in the mornings, just going, oh, what can I do today to make my dream come true? It was, it was just the most amazingly life-affirming yeah. 
thing to take on. And so be committed to it, only just be committed to it, to a, to a vision. Yeah. And, and things just mobilize. I mean, people would just come into my life when I needed them. And it was almost like magic. I mean, it really felt like the universe. I think fortune does favor the bold. Mm. And I th- a really important thing that I've learned and keep having to relearn is not to look too far ahead down the line. Mm. And, um, there were times during the preparation that I would get freaked out at everything that needed to be done. It, it got even worse when I was on the ocean. I made the classic mistake of looking at 3,000 miles ahead of me and just going, oh my God. And I'm going at two miles an hour and I'm just extrapolating and thinking this is going to take me forever. And I just absolutely crushed my own morale. I just collapsed. I just kind of folded in under the, the weight of the enormity of this project and I've really learned much better now just to take it one day at a time I mean obviously when you're doing a huge voyage you do have to look further ahead because you need to take all your supplies with you for three months um, but then once you get out there really don't look too far down the road because that way lies madness you know really just <laughs> it took me about a million oar strokes to get across the Atlantic and I could only take one oar stroke at a time. And so I remind myself of that when I'm writing a book, that I can only write one word at a time. So don't start panicking about finding enough words to get to the end of the book. Just keep, you know, just keep going, keep putting, keep sticking your oars in the water. And I, I think you can really apply that to any big, overwhelming, daunting challenge. And yeah. uh, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? You know, to eat the whole oh, elephant at one time. So a lot of people who procrastinate get overwhelmed by, you know, all the steps they need to take instead of just sticking to that. There's a famous rock climber, so famous I've forgotten his name. <laughs> but he says just stick in your three foot uh, your th- uh, in your three foot space. So don't look at the top where you've got to get to. Just look three f- in your three foot wall, your three foot room three feet here, 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 and here. Just concentrate on that and then just keep doing that all the way to you, till you go to the top, which it sounds like what, what you did. So be yeah. committed to a vision. Don't look too far ahead uh, down the line. Uh, anything else Ooh, for us? Another one. <laughs> when I was trying to cross the equator, there were lots of really tricky currents around there that were just playing merry hell with my navigation. I was kind of squiggling around trying to get across the equator. And I got really sort of obsessive about this. And I, on my GPS, I zoomed the scale right in so that I could see as soon as I was going the wrong way. And it was driving me nuts. And eventually, uh, someone commenting on my blog said, zoom out the scale on your GPS and you'll see that you're still making progress in the right direction. Wow. Yet, at the same time as you need to keep in the rock climbing analogy, on the one hand, you do need to keep your focus really tight and small but also if you are suffering setbacks and or going around in circles for a little while yeah. sometimes it does help to scale right back uh, obviously you don't have to do this if you're on a sheer rock face but you know in your mind to scale right back and get the big picture and see that you are in fact making progress towards your goal right okay and then uh anything else about when you get stuck in a situation in a bad situation how you get out of that how you have the courage to keep going? Um, I, just knowing that everything changes. There were times on the Atlantic, particularly when I was being blown backwards by a headwind. And um, you obviously can't put a, an anchor in the ocean floor because the ocean's about two miles deep on average. Um, so you're pretty helpless. You are getting blown backwards. And you can either get really frustrated about that or just know that eventually the wind's going to change back in your favor and mm. you'll be able to get going again. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's whatever situation you're in, it's temporary. Exactly. Um, unfortunately that goes for good situations as well as bad situations, but yes. you know, that's important too, to love the success while it's happening, but not to become too attached to it, to always be appreciative of it. And actually that gratitude thing is, is a really huge practice for me. Um, it was one of the good disciplines about writing a blog every night while I was on the ocean was that it enabled me to get some perspective on the day and pick out the things like the glorious sunset or, well, Hey, I only managed three miles today, but Hey, I managed three miles today. And to, to be grateful for the good stuff. Um, and I, I keep my gratitude journal 
every night just kind of write down the things that Me sort too. of yeah. I yeah. have a journal called the five minute journal, which are friends of mine own. And I write in it every morning. I wrote in it before we got, we jumped on the call here, just set rewires your brain and the neurons in your brain to, to be focusing on being appreciative rather than, you know, like always wanting things the whole time. It's hard because I'm one of those people who's always, I'm kind of don't give myself enough credit a lot of times and, and I'm always wanting more. And I think it's a, you know, it's a human trait, but That's writing good. in that gratitude diary just forces the habit of just going, hey, look, I, everything's pretty good. You know, well, there's lots yeah. to be appreciative for. Absolutely. And you know what? The people who believe they're lucky in life do tend to attract better outcomes. Psychologists have demonstrated this. So um, if, you, if you are counting your blessings, and, and you're right, we do have a, a negativity bias because historically or evolutionarily, we needed to focus on the problem that was the 2% rather than the 98% that was going great. Uh, it was the 2% was the saber tooth tiger that was going to come and bite you. Um, so that is the way that we're wired. But I think we can really balance that out by practicing that gratitude. And yeah, it's probably like the, the, the single biggest happiness boosting thing that I do. Okay. All right. So let's just review that there. We've been talking to Roz Savage and we're going to let her go in just a few minutes here. Um, but uh, Roz was the only woman in the world to cross three oceans and she rode. She quit her high powered London job to become an ocean rower. And what are the lessons we learned? Well, number one, be committed to a vision. Be committed to your vision. This will unleash your inner strength and your determination. Number two, don't look too far ahead down the line. Just take it one step at a time. Yes, understand what the end goal and the end vision is, but don't get overwhelmed by all the, the number of steps you need to take. Just, just go one step at a time, one step at a time. Uh, know that everything changes. Whatever situation you are in, it is temporary, okay? If you are struggling right now, if you're down and out, know that the darkest part of the night is right before the dawn. It's temporary. Things will change. The only thing that stays the same is that things are always changing. And then gratitude, always write uh, in a blog every day if you can, or if not, just always look at things to be grateful for, the sun, the bed that you're sleeping in, the food that you're eating, the friends that you have, the conversations you get to have. Believe you're lucky and you will attract better outcomes. So just before we go, thank you for sharing those, Roz. They're amazing. They're, they're wonderful themes. I appreciate that. Just before you go, we're gonna, I'll just take one more question from our Facebook live viewers. And if you're listening to this on the podcast, uh, be sure to go to James Swanick Official on Facebook and hit like because you'll be able to watch some of these live calls. If you're watching on Facebook right now, just ask one more. Let's, we'll take one more question and, um, for Roz. And while we're waiting for that, we'll, we'll do a little Snapchat as well for my Snapchat viewers. Roz, we might just do like your number one tip for, for, for courage or success, I think maybe. So I'll get you to prepare that while we're waiting for a question to come in here from Facebook Live. Facebook Live, we've got one question. We want to ask Roz Savage, the rower of, uh, who rode across three oceans. Uh, uh, here we go. How do you have so much stamina? Do you say that it's training or DNA? Oh, that's really an interesting question. I think I do naturally have quite good physical stamina um i've done a couple of marathons and um did pretty respectable times in those um i think it's actually more the um the mental stamina mm -hmm. i think i've always been pretty tenacious once i set my mind to something then i will generally see it through so um I, I did train for up 16 hours a day on the rowing machine in the run up to the Atlantic Road. Complete waste of time. Um, <laughs> getting injured, <laughs> not to mention phenomenally boring. Um, but it did at least give me the self belief that I could row for ridiculous amounts of time. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. So mostly, in, mostly in the mind. Uh, thank you very much, Facebook viewer. If you've been watching, we're going to switch off now and just finish the podcast. Say goodbye, Roz. You can just... Bye, Facebook. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much, Rosa. I really appreciate it. So we're going to say goodbye to our Facebook viewers. There we go. And uh, now we're going, to do a little, we're going to do a little Snapchat just before you go. Um, we're going to have my uh, Snapchat viewers get a, some words of inspiration from you, if you're willing. Um, let's do this here. So let's 
And if you're listening on the podcast, make sure you follow me on Snapchat. It's just my name, James Swanick, and you get little 10-second videos, little words of wisdom every day. You can follow the day in the life of me. All right, Roz, here we go. So I'll set it up, and then you're going to uh, give three tips, three tips for success. Have you got three of them? Mm, I've got one. Let's okay, see. one, one. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. We've got one. Let's have a look here. And we've only got 10 seconds to squeeze this in, by the way. So, uh, it's because that is, that's what Snapchat gives us. So, Roz Savage, only woman in the world to row across three oceans. Three, two, one. Roz Savage, only woman in the world to cross three oceans in a rowboat. What's your tip for success? Find what you love and just do it and do it and do it until you get really, really good at it. Hang on a second. We've got the first part of it. Do what you love and do it, exclamation mark. Hang on, here we go. One second. Whoops. Sorry about this, Ros, and sorry about this if you're listening on the... On the uh... I don't think I've ever seen one person use so many different social media platforms all at once. There you go. So you can, just, you can finish that thought. Uh, three, two, one. I'm sorry, I thought you were going to do your bit first. <laughs> no, no, no. Hang on a second. Hang on. Here we go. We're going to do it again. So, Super. <laughs> three, two, one. Find the thing that you love and just do it. I love it. Thank you so much, Roz. Great work. Make sure you follow her on Facebook. Details to come. There we go. So I will, uh, I will put that there. So Ross, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. Thank you for inspiring me uh, with, your, with your three trips and just you know, your hero's journey. And thank you for inspiring uh, my listeners and my, and my followers. Uh, a really amazing effort. And uh, I know we all can, can learn a lot from you and be inspired by you ongoing. So I appreciate you. your time very much. Well, I really appreciate the work that you're doing and thank you for giving me a chance to share my message with, with your folks because um, that's what it's all about. And um, I, I know that people do find the story inspiring and I really do think that, that that rising tide lifts all boats. So, you know, we're all, we're all supporting each other. Other people inspire me and it's, it's all this kind of beautiful, virtuous cycle. So thanks, James, for the amazing work that you do. You're so welcome and thank you, Roz. All right, Roz Savage, there you are. Make sure you follow her at rozsavagecoaching.com and I will catch you on the next one.